Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the United States Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. at the European Union's annual Defense and Security Conference here in Washington that is co-sponsored by the European Union as well as foreign policy. Uh, and we're talking to Alex uh, Crowther, uh, Dr. Uh, Alex Crowther, who is a senior uh, research fellow at the National Defense University, uh, expert on Europe, uh, all things uh, security, but also uh, cyber, uh, United, retired United States Army. Me, uh, Colonel with a lot of operational uh, experience as well. Alex, I want to start off on uh, the Baltimore hack. Um, we've seen incidents like this over the years. This is probably one of the first times that a major metropolitan area has not only been hacked but refused to pay a ransom, as far as we know, uh, effectively saying, you know, we're going to rebuild all of these databases from scratch. More importantly, what are some of the key lessons uh, from this incident that tells us about how? sort of societally we've got to deal with this problem, given that that appears to have been a criminal intrusion. But there are also nation states that are involved in this space as well. What's the way to think about the space and best protect ourselves? So, Vago, uh, there's actually been uh, 170 state and local uh, ransomware attacks uh, since 2013 when the Swansea, Massachusetts Police Department was uh, first hit by ransomware. Baltimore has been hit three times, once during the riot several years ago once uh, a year ago, March, and now. Uh, so 17% uh, of the victims uh, pay the ransom, the others do not. Um, the lessons learned are, uh, there's essentially four lessons learned, right? Uh, you've, uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to have a plan first of all, right? Uh, second of all, you have to back up all your data, preferably daily. That way, if somebody says, I'm going to destroy your data, you just go back to yesterday afternoon's data, and you've only lost a few hours worth of transactions. Um, the third one is that uh, you need to be able to function without electronics. You have to have a, a, a backup system to be able to do things by paper. That's what Baltimore is doing now with most of their functions. And the last one is we really need our senior leaders to think about cybersecurity because they're clearly not apportioning enough resources to it. It's kind of a, a, an, either an afterthought or a nuisance where actually it's a core function of a government. Do you see this? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because everybody's been looking at a paperless lifestyle effectively. This is just a really good reminder that you can't entirely go to a paperless uh, lifestyle in many respects. What are, how much of this is a technological problem? How much of this is a research problem? How much of this is a cultural problem? Or is it actually a blend of all three of them? It's a blend of all three. Uh, what's happening, is, for instance, half of Americans don't use an antivirus. The most popular password in the United States is password. The next, next most popular is one, some variant on 12345. And so we really need a, a holistic uh, training and education approach starting in kindergarten and going all the way up through senior leaders here in the United States uh, because we're just uh, not clued into it. Imagine a United States where 350 million people did not click on the link. <laughs> that's actually, that's, that actually would be something that would be uh, worth seeing. And then, you can, and then you can have a national competition for like, oh my God, you were the guy who clicked on the link and brought everything down. Uh, no. Um, do you think though that, uh, you know, the Government Accountability Office uh, last year, if I recall correctly, did a study that indicated that something like 80% of actually some of the nation's most classified networks are actually protected by by very, very weak passwords at the end of the day. Do you think that the military services and the government is doing a, you know, what do they have to do in this uh, spectrum as well? Because it's one thing to build a really, really important and classified battle network, then actually compromise it because you don't have the right, you know, you pick password one, two, three to be your password. Well, uh, the really important data is uh, kept on separate networks that do not connect to the internet. Um, and so uh, what you really have to do, you can't protect everything. Uh, so you have to do kind of a tiered system where you have to identify your crown jewels and protect them really well, and then other stuff you don't have to protect as well. We don't do that. We try the protect everything theory. 
Uh, DHS is working on it. DHS is responsible for working with the population, with state, local, and tribal governments, tribal and territorial governments. Um, the Department of Defense is, is doing their own thing. They're responsible for three things. Uh, the defense of their own networks, uh, crime having to do with the defense industrial base, and crime having to do with people who are members of the Department of Defense. But that's it as far as they're concerned. DHS is the major player here. Does the United States have to forge uh, a better cyber coalition? I know NATO is working, for example, has working groups, has a command that's uh, trying to address some of these cyber challenges, but they are pretty profound. And if you look at it, sometimes there is a lowest common denominator problem. Not everybody can protect themselves the exact same way. A little bit like during the Cold War, the Russians knew where they could get information, and it didn't necessarily have to be cracking U.S. networks. You could crack an allied network that has access to those same battle plans, uh, for example. Uh, what is how should the alliance and, and the United States and its allies collectively be thinking about this space, given how active Russia, China, uh, North Korea, Iran, and criminal groups are in trying to exploit all sorts of cyber vulnerabilities for their advantage? Well, Vago, I'm actually talking to the cyber people at NATO about this, uh, and their main concern is a wide disparity in cyber capability. You know, at the high end, you have the U.S., the U.K., France, Germany, and at the other end, you have smaller countries. They specifically mentioned Montenegro to me as the newest ally. Uh, what NATO does is it uh, gives uh, a minimum standard to the allies. And they said, this is what you, this is the minimum standard you must meet in cybersecurity in order to be allowed into NATO networks. And if they don't meet that minimum criteria, they're not allowed uh, to communicate with the NATO networks. So they're, they're working on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's so many different priorities, information, uh, rebuilding, uh, you know, the German military, things like that. Uh, so cyber is just one priority among many. Uh, but I know they're working it hard. Uh, and, and we've seen, for example, the Germans uh, creating 16,000 uh, member cyber corps, for example. So it's obviously clear that our allies are uh, taking it seriously. Well, I want to ask you about devolution of um, offensive authority. Uh, until just a little while ago, that was reserved for the president to make the decision. This administration has vested uh, offensive cyber uh, response capabilities at lower levels. Talk to us about the blend and how to be thinking about this fluid space in which uh, Marine Corps Commandant Bob Neller, r I think, rightly observes we've been at war for the last 10 years. What's the right blend of, of defense, defense and offense, or defense and offense, to look at in, in terms of trying to uh, better protect your networks uh, from, from constant attack? So, I mean, you can go back to uh, Joe Nye's uh, updates on deterrence theory in the last 20 years. Uh, and so you have to have uh, both punishment and denial are the first two. And then uh, Nye adds uh, entanglements and norms as two more. So uh, what's happening is uh, we're not denying them and we're not punishing them. So the whole idea behind devolution of this uh, would be to punish people who are trying to do cyber operations against us. At the same time, you're improving your security to do the den denial part. If they can't get the information, uh, that's going to deter them in the long run. We're at a European Union Defense and Security uh, Conference uh, on the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings, one of history's greatest military operations. There's a lot of focus on the relationship between the United States and its allies and, and the rather strained relationship between the United States and its allies. European nations are spending more money uh, overall. You were just in Germany. Um, give us a little bit of a feedback on what you're hearing, because the Germans, on the one hand, have been talking about steadily increasing defense spending, and even at 1.5 percent, it's the biggest economy in Europe, so it's a considerable amount of spending, as Germans always like to point out to me. What's, what are some of the key messages you took away from your visit to Berlin? So uh, the, uh, the Germans uh, actually decreased their military budget this year. They agreed in Wales, along with everybody else in 2014, to increase their budget to 2% of GDP by 2024. Uh, but then in the last elections, the SPD did not do very well. That's the, the center-left party, which is in coalition with Angela Merkel's center-right party, the CDU. And so the SPD has uh, latched upon this as uh, something to make them stand out from the rest of the crowd of German parties. So they have chosen uh, 
the uh, resistance against Donald Trump's insistence that they pay 2% as uh, one of their major platforms, major planks in their platform. And so because they control the uh, finance ministry, they're able to suppress the spending. So uh, 2%, yeah, that's the agreement. Um, I tend to uh, focus more on readiness. So the uh, German submarines are at 33% roughly, uh, German tanks are at 40% roughly, and German fighter aircraft are at 45% roughly. All those numbers should be between 70 and 90, right? And so I think that the Germans, were they to achieve a 70 to 90% operational readiness uh, rating on all of their equipment, would have a great argument on we don't need to continue to, to boost our budget, but until 70% of their equipment is ready, it, it kind of delegitimizes their argument that they don't want to spend any more money. Although uh, German leaders will say that we're, you know, this, this was a problem that took a long time to get us here and we're working our way uh, out of a hole. In terms of a cut, is it a reduction in the rate of increase or is it an actual cut in terms of where the budget's going to go? Because Germany did have a relatively uh, aggressive ramp. Being yes, a, a, budget, a budget yes. guy, I'm, I'm looking yes. at whether or not, so the vector is still up but not as up as it was. Um, I think it's kind of flattened out is where it is. Uh, this all started under the uh, Schroeder um, government where they zeroed out the budget for maintenance. And of course, you know, 10 years later, uh, you reap what you sow. And so they're trying to, it, it's expensive to re, uh, rebuild your maintenance capability. Uh, and they're having a, a shortfall with uh, industrial capability. They can only, they only have so many dry docks. Right? And they, they can only refurbish so many tanks so fast. And so it's not just uh, uh, the budget, but it's also uh, shrinking, hard, uh, steel bashing industry. Uh, you and I have been on a couple of trips uh, to Europe where we've talked to some of our closest allies. Do you think that there is a danger that when you make it exclusively about the 2%, about the spending, about economic concessions, and spend more money and spend it with us, otherwise you're not a good ally. At what point does that message actually backfire on the United States in terms of a message that it's taking to its allies? Because that's certainly how allies perceive it. Well, it certainly gave the SPD the opportunity to say no. Uh, and so different allies are reacting different ways. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, essentially northern, if, there, if you imagine a, a line from northwest Europe to southeast Europe, everybody north of the line worried about Russia, everybody south of the line is worried about migration, short term from the Middle East, long term from Africa. So you actually have to scratch both of those itches simultaneously. You have to have the conventional capability to deter the Russians, while at the same time you have to deploy enough uh, police Coast Guard and Navy supporting the Coast Guard capability to stop those migrants. This is what the Germans' point of view is. They're investing money in Africa to build the African uh, economies so the Africans will stay home. Uh, and so they've got a valid point that uh, they are, this money that they're investing is a long term investment in national security. Uh, as they would say, this is a security generator uh, at, the, at the end of the day. Dr. Alex uh, Crowder, uh, Senior Research Fellow at the National Defense University. Alex, it's always a pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Vago.